you know, I mean, anybody who's been recording for a while can, you know, get a basic good drum sound or whatever, can get signal to tape okay. If you've been engineering records for a while, you probably work out that math. But then there's a whole nother level of how sounds and things fit together to make an effect. And that's a record as I see it. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hello, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, the show bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is a rock star named Ken Stringfellow a musician, songwriter, producer, arranger who formed the power pop band The Posies in 1988 with John Auer. He was signed to Geffen Records in the 90s, releasing their critically acclaimed album Frosting on the Beater in 1993, and the band continues to make highly praised records today, releasing their eighth album to date, Solid States. Notably, Ken was an important part of the revival of the band Big Star. From 1993 until the death of Alex Chilton in 2010, Ken played bass and sang with Big Star. He also helped create the band's 2005 album, In Space, which was their first since the 1978's Timeless Third, Sister Lovers. And you may also recall that my previous guest on the show, Jody Stevens, was the drummer for Big Star in episode 39. Ken also spent 10 years on the road and in the studio with R.E.M., appearing on two albums, 2001's Reveal and 2004's Around the Sun, playing keyboards, bass, guitar, and accordion during headlining slots at Glastonbury, Rock in Rio, as well as on TV shows such as Top of the Pops, Saturday Night Live, and later with Jules Holland. Ken continues to also create his own solo records, including This Sounds Like Goodbye, Touched, Soft Commands, and Danzig in the Moonlight. During his four-decade career, his collaborations and credits have included playing guitar in punk legends Lago Wagon. Am I pronouncing that right? Uh, Lagwagon. Lagwagon. Okay, great. Yeah. Producing and engineering albums for Damien Hirando. Gerardo. Gerardo. Okay. Yeah. Was, help me out. Thank you. I appreciate that. The Long Winters, China's Hang Guy. You got to correct me on that one. I, that, I can't that was, be saying that right. You got that one right. That All right. Okay. Yeah. And dozens more. He has also worked with Snow Patrol, Neil Young, Patti Smith, Mud Honey, Death Cab for Cutie, The Head and the Heart, and many others. Mm -hmm. Thank you to rock star Tyler Green, who, after listening to my episode with Jody Stevens, recommended that we invite Ken to join us on the show as well. And thank you, Ken, for agreeing to do it so quickly. My pleasure. Please welcome Ken Stringfellow mm -hmm. to Recording Studio Rockstars. Ken, are you ready to rock? Totally ready to rock. I was born ready to rock. I know that about you, man. <laughs> you look like somebody who was born ready to rock. Goodness gracious. Well, <laughs> high praise. Um, so, so, Ken, fill in some of the gaps for us. Tell us more about how you got started out in music and sort of, you know, forming your band, The Posies. And I also like to ask this kind of twist on the question. Mm -hmm. Tell us what did starting out in music and recording smell like to you? Oh, interesting. Um, well, there's a good story in all of that. Um, you know, I played in a few little bands starting in middle school uh, here in Bellingham, Washington, you know, in the early 80s. During those formative years, I met my future bandmate in the Posies, John Auer, when he moved back to Bellingham after living somewhere else for a while. And uh, he was a great guitar player, and um, we also became very good friends, especially when, when I first met him. He was still in middle school, and I was in my first year of high school. But the next year, when he came to high school, we were able to like hang out all the time. And John and his dad had done something really extraordinary in that um, they had put together a little analog recording studio in their house. So as we all know now, you know, having something that you could call a recording setup is pretty easy um, and pretty cheap. But back then, you know, it was quite bulky. <laughs> well, let's just say that yeah, really. the, the, the pieces were bigger. They had a, um, a half-inch eight-track, a Tascam, whatever that was, 88 or whatever. They had a little, like, Tapco mixing board and various pieces of outboard gear, um, which is pretty cool considering in the 80s, 
um, people were starting to turn their nose up at the quote unquote obsolete gear from the sixties. So they had, you know, an LA two a and they, and, uh, some other, you know, fantastic vintage gear. Cause at that time, nobody wanted it. Yeah. Um, you, it almost sounds that, like you, you got to start out with a bit of a silver spoon, which is pretty cool. <laughs> it, re- it really was. I mean, it was a musician's, a, a silver fader. I yeah. Guess. So the silver uh, fader award. I said, you know, John's dad is a great musician and was really into the folk scene here in Bellingham in the 70s. And, and but, you know, became a college professor here at uh, Western Washington University. So he had a good gig and wanted to, you know, really encourage John in music and recording. And they started out with a you know cassette four track and then they bought more things and then it ended up with that eight track studio. So we had that as our playground. Uh, every day after school, all through high school, and we did all kinds of crazy music and experiments and some really cool stuff. De- Bellingham is is an hour and a half due north from Seattle. We're about an, another twenty five minutes from the Canadian border on the way up towards here. Vancouver. Yeah. Okay, groovy. Thanks. We're about halfway, we're kind of equidistant. It's just you know about the same amount of time to get to Vancouver as it is to Seattle where we are which did play into my musical influences early on because we we got Canadian radio which could reflect British radio which was always you know a few months ahead of the American radio in certain aspects you know we heard the Smiths and things like that maybe a good year and a half before they you know anybody heard about them through uh you know in the states um and it wasn't Kurt Cobain kind of from just north of Seattle as well Kurt Cobain came from Aberdeen, which is south of Seattle, um, in the, you know, the very, uh, well, and even murky, if, it, if you could imagine an even murkier part of the Northwest than where I live, Aberdeen is very murky and rainy and soggy and, and dark, wow. um, <laughs> and, and, and poor, you know, it's kind of like logging towns kind of past their, past their prime and to some degree. Yeah. Sort of apropos for some of the music, I guess. I guess so. Yeah. And as far as an early smell, so, you know, we were down in this basement rec room and I have to like go back to that basement rec room where the studio was set up. I'm going to say that it smelled like cats, not (laughs) cat pee, but just kind of cat, you know, the cat would hang out down there. Um, And then I guess I can remember it like, you know, it's the smell of that old gear warming up mixed with, you know, we had this um, acoustical foam, uh, the kind that's made of little, like, basically upright scales at right angles to each other, if that makes right, sense. Right, right. Um, and that that stuff had its own, you know, I'm sure it was leaching all kinds of chemicals <laughs> into the room. So that had its own particular smell. And then, you know, analog tape has that magical smell, too. Well, that's so cool that you guys started your band playing together as early as the first year of high school. It's sort of, in a way, that's everybody's dream, maybe, or everybody's biggest disappointment is when that band of your youth, maybe for most people, inevitably breaks up and then you look to reform it again. It's pretty cool that you were able to just carry that through. Yes. Well, we we were in a lot of different bands in high school with wildly different styles. You know, we tried a lot of things, um, you know, just being curious people. And we did things together and separately we kept gravitating back towards, you know, mutual care for song craft. It's always true that there's always like gimmicky music and the eighties, of course, with the kind of synth revolution that had come along and done some wonderful things, but there was a lot of gimmicky pop music that we, we felt like sometimes, you know, production was trying to equal a song. And, and that isn't really my view. My view is that the song could survive any kind of production and still, you know, it's, it's, it's essence would still come through when we sought to make songs that you could, you know, play on two acoustic guitars, but you could also layer them up. You could do them, you know, on synths, you could do them on piano, you could do them with distorted guitars, whatever. And they would still, you know, they, they would still carry their essential meaning, um, and survive whatever, whatever kind of clothing you wanted to put on them. That was kind of what we, the conclusions we were coming to with these different different bands and different experiments that we undertook in our formative years. And so when I moved to Seattle, I graduated high school in 1986. I moved to Seattle to go to the University of Washington. Um, and we stayed in touch and started trading tapes back and forth. And by 1987, you know, we were starting to envision a project that was very much oriented around songcraft 
And that was what became the posies. Yeah, I love hearing that expression trading tapes because that was such a cool thing that existed in the 90s or in the 80s and continued some through the 90s. And then, you know, maybe by late 90s, the people who were still trading tapes were pretty hardcore, you know, to be doing it. But Larry Crane was on the show and he talked about that too. He still has a massive collection of tapes um, where he is. And I used to just really appreciate seeing some of my friends do that. There was a thing that maybe was common or not, but you'd sort of make a tape and then whoever made the really coolest, clever collage cover or colored it in really nicely, you know, made the nicest tapes. Yeah. You know, we, we, when we started touring, you know, like we didn't have a CD player in our van, you know, we had a tape deck, of course. And so you made compilation tapes of all the music you wanted to share with your bandmates to their chagrin or to their delight, um, depending on yeah how compatible your tastes were. Well, the compilation tape was also also notably a, re- a gesture of true love, right? It was the thing you did for the girl you were trying to get their attention. Yes, indeed. You make uh, the, the compilation tape for them. You could also make a nasty breakup tape. I actually did that <laughs> times too. Yes. Um, I will say also that, you know, um, we were talking about my involvement with the band Big Star. One of the things that that happened early in our career um, is that uh, we had an early glimpse because there was this, an album made by the guitarist of Big Star, Chris Bell, who quit after the first album and ha- had numerous troubles after that. He had mm-hmm. some, you know, he had did, he was a junkie and this kind of stuff, um, and had some emotional issues, etc. And eventually, he died in a car wreck. You know, but he was kind of unraveling up to that point. He died in 1978. He had left behind this this record that, you know, we could call finished and he'd recorded with Jeff Emmerich and a couple other things like that. Um, and it never came out. Um, and so when we started coming on the scene in 1988, um, and people heard our, you know, chimey guitar pop, they said, Oh, well, you got to hear big star, which is already difficult to encounter. And then, you know, as we got further into it, people passed us cassettes of the Chris Bell album because it had been, you know, dubbed from cassette to cassette and passed mm-hmm. around in the, you know, underground railroad of musicians in the know. And of course, having that happen, you know, what happens, uh, when, by the time we heard the Chris Bell record, um, who knows what key the stuff was in because those tapes, you know, were all being, you know, through, through wow and flutter and fluctuation from machine to machine. I'm sure we'd, we'd, yeah. we'd gone up or down a whole step. Well, keep going. So were you instrumental in kind of bringing about Oh, uh, I Am the Cosmos, yeah. the album. I wouldn't say we were instrumental. I think there was groundswell in it happening, but but we, well, you never know. I mean, we when we heard this song for the first time, we were, were like recovering the, the title track of the album, I Am the Cosmos. Yeah. Uh, when we heard the song for the first time, we're like recovering this. You know, we started playing it in our live sets. Um, and, you know, I think Ryko Disc was on the point to release the album anyway, but we certainly you know, started getting that song out there. Um, we definitely were covering it and playing it live before it was re-released. Yeah, I heard that recording. It's very cool. It's such a fantastic record, too. Um, and it's a cool, really cool to hear the story of it, you know, kind of floating around on the scene before it got re-released, because I hadn't heard that story. Yeah. Uh, by the time I discovered it, it, of course, was already out. And I didn't even discover Big Star until late 90s when my friends turned me on to it. And this is embarrassing to admit, but I only discovered Big Star after I had already opened up for Alex Chilton in St. Louis with my band. Oh, wow. Well, so, he would probably have been thrilled to hear that. You yeah. Know, he, um, the subject of Big Star uh, was somewhat contentious for Alex. He felt it was a, a failed project that warranted no further scrutiny. Wow. Um, though he was willing to play the songs live, and I think even by the end of his life, was starting to see the appreciation. I think he felt like the appreciation for Big Star was just because it failed and it became like a difficult, like a cult item. And he felt that, you know, he said, I don't think the music warrants it. Hmm. Um, But when I think as the, as Big Star's second life grew in popularity and we were playing, you know, sold out shows in New York and all this stuff, I think, you know, towards the end, he, he kind of was like, all right, people actually do like this music you know, and, and the music is available. So they're not just liking it because it's hard to like or difficult. I think people, I think there actually is a genuine groundswell and yeah. he, he was, oh, he seemed to be okay with it. Well, I love it. <laughs> yeah, It was too. one of those albums that became 
you know, it was, I think I had the double album, um, uh, Radio City, a number one record. And, mm -hmm. and when I first started listening to that, it was one of those classic favorite records that became like my number one record to listen to, but it took a few listens before I got it. At first yeah. I heard it and I didn't get it. And then after a few listens, all of a sudden it just clicked with me. And I love that about favorite music that sometimes you don't even understand it the first time you hear it. And then when you do, it's like your mind just opens up. Yes, this is that's a great feeling when that happens. Well, so Ken, I like to ask guests on the show to share an inspirational quote to kind of get us kicked off. Huh. And we'll dig into some deeper questions. Have you got anything you'd like to share with us to get us excited about hitting the studio and making music and records? I've sometimes debated whether or not I'm like a quote unquote good record producer, because I, I always feel every time we enter the studio, we should be trying to, you know, make sounds that no one's heard before. You know, there's a school of thought that says you should learn how to make sounds that are in the contemporary, you know, vocabulary and right. that you should emulate that to some degree if you want your artist to be successful. But I figure, you know, there's a lot of people who have that ground covered. And you also need explorers. So, you know, I, I see every record, whether the artist is very well established or as, you know, making their first recording as a fantastic opportunity to invent something completely new. Um, and I, and that's really, you know, they pay me for this, but I mean, it is just when you feel like you've hit it and you've created something like, wow, this is a sound that is quite unique uh, and, a, and a blend that's quite unique and I've never heard anything like it. Um, you know, that's such a, that's, that's the meaning. That's the way, that's why we're, that's why I'm doing this. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I think about that concept of, of thinking that every new record, every new session is an opportunity to explore new territory. It's got multiple layers. So for example, yeah. there, there have been times where, you know, sometimes we might go up against looking for that new thing and realize we're trying too hard to make something mm -hmm. new where it, it's not necessary. But also it reminds me of the times where I've been making a record with an artist and we might've found ourselves kind of running out of inspiration. Uh, mm -hmm. This is, of course was one of these examples of, you know, working way too long on a record with an <laughs> artist, but inevitably, like if we discovered a new instrument or something that had a new sound that would spark a new level of creativity. And I feel like that plays into that same concept. It's like sometimes just having a new tool, a new toy, a new musical instrument can kind of open doors to, to new territory for you. Def definitely. I mean, they're all laid out, you know, scale wise, a little bit different, uh, differently. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really got into the, the guitarette. I discovered this instrument, uh, when I was doing a session in Holland and a great musician, uh, brought he, who has a lot of esoteric instruments brought down a guitarette. Never heard of it, never seen one before. As soon as I started playing this thing, I immediately started going on eBay and buying them, and I have like four of them now. Nice. Um, in, in case I have to replace the the parts. Um, Can for, you describe a guitarette to us? A guitarette. So there's um, the instrument builder over at Honer who gave us the clavinet, the pianet. Oh, nice. Um, he. He built this instrument uh, in the 60s, and he envisioned it as, you know, he said, when this comes out, the electric guitar is over. Um, <laughs> and it didn't quite work out that way, but basically what it is, is uh, imagine like a milk carton s size and shaped object um, with a little handle at the end like you might have on a, on a keytar. So the idea is you kind of balance it in your lap. You got your left hand, you know, Basically, the the thing on the on the handle for your left hand is a is a sustain pedal, so you can when you let go, it will dampen. And mm -hmm. then you have sticking out of one side of the instrument, arranged in in little like diamonds, basically of fourths. You have these little metal tongues that stick out through holes in the instrument, and you basically flick those like you would the metal in a kalimba, and they then each one produces a tone. So you can you know you can flick them in rapid succession and, and get nice arpeggios. You can, you know, you got four fingers, you can make little chords. And it's, it's basically a, a very nicely tuned kalimba that has like a bell-like, a bell-like tone. Um, you know, it's funny, as soon as you said the guitarette, I wrote down the pianet because I, I remember first discovering that on a record and I couldn't believe the sound. It's just 
such a fantastic sound. And it's a weird, it's similar. It's sort of like a kalimba tines, but it, it seemed to use hammers that instead of hammering and hitting the, the tines, they had sticky rubber on them. And when exactly. you, you'd lift them up they and it'd sort of pull, pull off and, and pluck. Back. What a weird idea to come up with, you know? Um, well, it's just very cool. You know what? The other thing I like hearing you talk about was when you first started out in bands, rather than having a whole series of bands being a, maybe a frustration, like I, I really want to get this one band going and you've got a bunch of bands going, which might some people might be experiencing. I just heard somebody else talking recently about the frustrations of trying to form a band and then realizing they needed to do more solo sets. Mm -hmm. But but I like that it, you took a positive away from that as an opportunity to really expose yourself to playing songs in many different fashions. You know, maybe you're learning how to play the song on piano. Maybe you're learning how to play it on acoustic or on electric. And uh, yeah, it's it, a great exploration of songs and the value of song. True. I mean, we, in these early bands that we had in, or that I had, you know, with other people or whatever, um, you know, we had a total like AOR something like Journey or something like that sounding band. <laughs> we had um, a completely synth based with sequences and everything, you know, only playing to sequencers uh, type band um, at one point. I had a, a kind of experimental like band that combined found sounds and improvisations and tape loops and all kinds of things kind of band. Um, John Auer was a, you know, uh, a heavy metal fan in his early days and, and, and played in metal bands. We had basically, and I played in like straight up punk bands and things like that too. And, you know, I think one thing that's kind of cool about living in a small town as we did, there just isn't enough of anybody to go around to really develop a completely self-contained musical scene. You know, there just aren't enough punks in town to have a punk scene. You know, everybody's got to kind of like volunteer for other kinds of music um, to, you know, and, and so you end up playing with different people and, you know, it's, it's kind of a, you know, a polyglot musical scene by necessity. We're like Seattle, the big city, you know, um, there are quite enough, there was enough kids just in one school, um, to kind of produce one musical scene that, that where they all shared an aesthetic and, and that is what produced, you know, that, that musical explosion. Right. You Gave know? it an identity that could be recognized outside of the city. Yes. Um, well, so you travel a lot and you, yeah. you meet a lot of people in a lot of different places. How mm -hmm. often do you have somebody, you know, out of frustration explain to you that there just isn't enough music where I'm from or there's nothing going on? Do you, do you run into people offering that complaint and do you ever have a solution for them or, or encouragement? Well, um, it's funny, you know, I, I actually um, was having a discussion, you know, with my... The, the guy who I formed my first band with, uh, you know, in seventh grade, um, and who in that band is the band that John Auer joined, uh, when I was in, uh, ninth grade in first year of high school. Um, this guy, Chip Westerfield, um, he lives here in Bellingham and he is, you know, a freelance recording engineer. I think for him, uh, the frustration is that, you know, there is work to be done. Um, there's, there's vanity projects, there's people trying to quote unquote make it either early in life or later in life. And I think, you know, he found that in a, in a small town like this, there is a, an expectation that he can work miracles and B that that will sort of obviate the need for them to really push themselves and practice. Mm -hmm. So that, that's something. So it's, it's all weird, right? We all, we, you know, like if you're like completely like struggling, um, like financially, it's, pretty hard to like justify the time to make music. If you are really comfortable, you might even have lots of extra time and just, you know, you fill your day with, you know, little tidbits and errands and mm -hmm. whatever. You don't get anything done. Um, I wish I had a formula for the sweet spot, but I can tell you that as applies to me, I can really only talk with authority about my own experience. The fact that, you know, I never have made like a million dollars in one sitting is a really good thing. I need to keep working. Um, and so I need to keep my skills up and I need to, you know, I'm, I'm working with people who are, you know, outside of the mainstream usually, 
mm-hmm. with occasional, you know, occasional things that I work with a really well-known artist. But generally, you know, I'm down there where where the ne- the next music is coming from. Um, you know, I, I figure it's a good month if I'm working with a majority of people who are under 25, you know, or something right, like that. Right. Um, I mean, I'll work with anybody, but I mean, if, if there's a steady stream of young people coming my way, that th- this probably means that I'm in a good place because that's, you know, they're the next generation of music makers and listeners. How often when you're working with young people, are you sort of tickled by seeing how they are reinterpreting what you had started to take for granted musically. Do you know what I mean? Like they're rediscovering the things that you have known about for, for so long and, and it's fresh again, you know? True. I mean, I I think it's just always impressive. Older people, you know how it goes. I mean, uh, they can get kind of dismissive of younger people because, you know, you do, you have spent your life, amassing knowledge and you see and and you know young people are often very confident even when they have like a limited knowledge base to some degree so that can kind of tick older people off but having said all that i'm always impressed by how much you know the musicians at least are coming to me like how much homework they've done and how into it they are and how deep they've already gone yeah uh and you know their knowledge base is you know is pretty wide considering that they've probably been you know working on it for maybe 10 years um and then i think back to you know when i was you know 20 and you know i'd really i there's a lot i'd yet to learn about but you know i'd done the best i could um Mm -hmm. and and really had a pretty you know i'd gone into a lot of different things already and had had a pretty diverse and eclectic taste and you were already studying hard the stuff that had just preceded you exactly and, and, and it's great to be young because you just happen to know what everybody is into. It's just, you know, it, there's that uh, collective unconscious and zeitgeist that just flows when your generation is coming up because it's yeah. starting to gather info for how it will proceed and define itself. Well, I guess for all of us rock stars, it's the, you know, the encouragement that it's never too late to start getting excited about something and learning something new anyway. <laughs> True. You know, we can always dig in and... and it, just because somebody else knows a lot about it already doesn't mean it's too late for you to learn about it yourself. Exactly. I just went and, you know, stumbled upon this article um, that was, you know, 20 great or 40 great or whatever it was, uh, one record artist. Nice. It was in Rolling Stone recently. Um, and there were four or five records on there that were just like, holy crap, how has this escaped me this whole time? All right. So another question I really like to ask, Ken, is um, for you to share a story about an important failure along the way for you. Um, you know, you've done a lot of stuff and you stayed in this game for for four decades now, right? Well, let's see. Uh, 80s, 90s, noughties, and now, yeah. So. Noughties and now. I like it. Yeah. There's a few. I mean, they come to mind. Things that where I didn't see things get realized the way I hoped. Um you know, I, for example, with the Posies, you know, our first album was just was made in that home studio of John's. Um, it, I think is a great album. I mean, it's it's you know got some kind of puppy like aspects to it, and it's a little dinky and retro, but um, it's got a sound for sure. And I think it's a very impressive feat of playing and composition for people who are teenagers. And the next record we did, um, you know, we had a major label budget and we worked with an engineer we really admired, John Leckie. Um, and I just, you know, we just, it was a very hard project to manage, you know, like having this huge budget and not knowing how much control to take. Um, mm-hmm. And thus, you know, not being able to communicate exactly what, not knowing when we could veto something. And thus, you know, like, that record for me, I think John did a, John Leckie did a wonderful job recording it. Um, and I think that, you know, I think the mixing, I think he tried to get too modern with it. Uh Um, and I wish that I'd spoken up more, but I, you know, I, I just deferred to his wisdom to some degree and I could have been, yeah, I've, I've come to find that, you know, everything that, um, I take away as time goes on is that the more control I have over a project and the, the more, the less 
deferring I do and doubting my own instincts when it goes counter to my own instincts, of course, you know, I, I, I like collaborating and whatnot. I mean, I'm, I don't make music in a one person vacuum, but, um, I just find that generally the, you know, if I leave the authority of decision-making to somebody else, it's probably going to go pear shaped, um, <laughs> in terms of result. Um, yeah. and you know, after that, you know, I started making records as an engineer really by accident. You know, we, in the band, we had this very capable engineer in John Hour. At one point I was asked to produce an album and we just worked with Don Fleming, uh, on frosting on the beater and Don Fleming, you know, was not an engineer by any means. He was just a guy who had a certain aesthetic and was very thorough about making sure that aesthetic got printed to tape and also just making the players and setting up a certain vibe. So you do your best. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, they, what they say about the, the classic producers, you know, the, the, the greatest producers did the least. Um, there's that, that, there's that trope, the Rick Rubin thing where he doesn't touch the records at all, but he comes in for perspective. But anyway, I thought I'd be making a record more like Don Fleming and that it was clear that I didn't engineer, but, and this was in 1995. Um, so this is communicating like by letters and facts, you know? Hmm. Um, but you know, I'd been to, we, the Posies had been touring over in Europe and we had a good name over there. And so that kind of opened up some doors where people wanted to associate with our good name. Um, and so I was invited to produce these albums and I showed up to the studio. Now I'd been along for some sessions in big studios at that point, And I'd been around some great producers, but I had actually hands on engineered, hardly anything beyond the four track level. Uh, basically the guy who ran the studio was also a bass player and he was annoyed that I had brought in a bass player for these sessions. Um, <laughs> so he, day one just said, here's the keys, bye. <laughs> wow. And so there I was with a band and no idea how patch bay works, no idea how any outboard gear works, no idea really what a mixing desk does. Uh, and they're all staring at me. And so I start thinking, mm, okay, well, I better look like I know what I'm doing. So, so you so just I, went on YouTube, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so I that was grabbed, a joke. Rock stars. There was no YouTube. There was no YouTube. Um, so I grabbed some mics, put them in mic stands, put them around the drum kit and, you know, put one in the kick drum, put one in the snare, it just went logical. And I said, okay, hopefully, you know, these holes, in the wall here where you plug the microphones in correspond to something on the mixing desk. Um, and luckily they were normaled. So, and they, w- this is over in Europe, you said, yeah, this is in Barcelona, Barcelona. So, so is, is the, is anything written in English or is it all written? Well, uh, there's in nothing Italian? written in anything. There's, uh, or Spanish. Well, yes. Yeah, so there's, there's just, you know, it's just patch bays and the, and yeah, numbers, the, the, the name of the gear, luckily, um, you know, but that's kind of universal, but as far as, you know, I mean, there's the mic plate in the recording room didn't even have numbers on it, but you figure that, you know, upper left is probably one and then going across. Yeah. So I plugged the kick drum into one and then pulled up one on the mixing desk and okay, hit your kick drum. Boof, boof. Ah, there's sound. Thank God. <laughs> and then, you know, luckily enough things in that studio were, were normal that like, you know, send, you know, like bus one went to track one on the tape machine and stuff like this. So I got through it. I engineered the stuff. I'm, I mixed the stuff, um, but you know, brought the tapes back to Seattle and mixed them. And it was just kind of going from there. But I mean, you can imagine that these records sounded completely nutballs, you know? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, like um, even just, so rock stars back then, if you had a, you know, a two inch reel of tape and you're recording on a tape machine in one studio, if you want to bring it and play it on another tape machine in another studio, you essentially, you know, the right way to do it is put tones on the tape at the beginning so that you can sort of align the machine in the next studio to play it back the same way that the first one that recorded it did. So you must have really been up against like, well, you I know, some scratch in your head. You know, like I could get tones and I could actually that, that all, I could get that done. And when I got to the next studio to mix, I could get the house engineer to align the machine to the tones. And, you know, I, I, you know, at least that got done, but just, you know, a guy using mics and compressors and in, in just kind of like kind of heavy handed ways, I guess, you know, like 
it wasn't like, well, let's try and use the compressor to get a nice, you know, level signal for this vocal. You know, I just basically like, let's turn this knob all the way to the right and <laughs> see what it sounds like. <laughs> sounds pretty cool. Well, that's you know. cool. So what, what was your takeaway? Did that kind of open your eyes to the engineering and did you start getting more involved after that? Definitely. Um, I just that the records, I mean, the first record I did that one of those two, I did two records back to back in that session in Spain. First one actually sounds pretty cool. I mean, it, 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 it sounds kind of old fashioned in a way because that, you know, my, my miking for the drums wasn't very tight. So the drums sound a little small and raggedy. Um, and there's some crazy stuff, psychedelic stuff that I did for this other band. And that, you know, it was, it's so wild that you kind of can't really argue with it. Um, but it, it didn't sound hi-fi by any means. And, but I just kept plugging away and doing records that were, you know, kind of funky sounding, but you know, things started to seep in little by little. And then I did the record for Damien Gerardo. This was in 1998. Uh, so I'd been working on stuff a little bit for three years. Uh, has a meowing cat here. Nice, nice. Um, yeah, that'll, you'll, that'll just have to become part of the lore here. He's a rock star or uh, she's a rock star. Yeah. Yeah. And so that record, you know, was a, was where kind of things started to sound good. And it was a wonderful studio, still exists, Robert Lang Studios. Um, and at that time, he had this incredible API desk. Um, and, you know, like, I have to say, um, people talk about how, you know, much help you get from Pro Tools or other, you know, DAWs recording and how they make that make your job easier than it should be. But I have to say that analog tape, I think made my job way easier. Hmm. You know, you start printing drums to it. They sound good. You print a vocal on it. It sounds good. I mean, it, it does so much of the work for you with that little bit of, it's a little bit of, you know, granulation and a little bit of compression and it, and it, you don't have to EQ out all, you know, harsh frequencies because they kind of just disappear with analog tape. Hmm. Um, at least that was my experience. I find, you know, there's now if in the digital world, like you record a signal and for example, something with low end has so much low end, you got to carve all this stuff out. Um, yeah, because yeah. there's, there's frequencies that the tape just, you know, they just dropped off at a certain point in the tape response and up top, the same thing. There's kind of no, everything is there. So you have to remove a lot more, um, where the, the tape had, you know, by comparison, a more limited frequency response. And so certain things just that you don't really need just kind of disappeared. Yeah, it's really, it's fascinating to me because I think about that a lot. And I wonder sometimes if the extension of resolution that, that digital is striving for was ever a good idea. <laughs> it's, it's a great idea. Um, it just, I think, takes extra work. You put the work in somewhere. Yeah. I mean, people obviously like in the analog world where uh, you know, going way back, you know, to the sixties where people were recording live, you know, I've worked with people from that generation, like Larry Nechtel, for example, who was one of the greatest session players of all time. Um, you know, and he just didn't need a second take of anything. He heard a song kind of, you know, charted it and like, okay, roll it. And then his first take would be totally usable. He, he did that through years and years of practicing and playing and, and, and being able to respond that way. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's something that, you know, now of course you don't really need. Um, it would be great if everybody did it, but, and there are players, of course, there's still players at that level, but the part and parcel of people that I work with, even, you know, people who aren't really known bands, you know, they kind of hack their way through it and you can just, you know, you chop it together and make a comp of whatever it is, an instrument, a vocal yeah. There you go. Well, I, it's I, like I know for sure that, that's, that the singers of that that's that there are more singers today than there probably should be. Let's put it that way. Uh, <laughs> that's a great quote. That's that's, just that's the, the clickable tweet right there from the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it's true though. I mean, I think that because of the shift in the way that recordings are done, rather than people strive towards excellence of performance, they've strived maybe towards excellence of using the tools, the digital tools, and comping and and producing and, you know, manipulating and editing. And whether that's a good or bad thing, I think that's just where the direction people go. It, it is. It is. And there's also, you know, like people have their concepts, you know, and, and you can make a very elaborate musical concept much in a much more quick fashion. You can get to it a lot quicker. I mean, imagine mm -hmm. like 
in certain aspects of the 60s recordings that we all love, you know, there's a concept and they spent probably, you know, two days, like, how do we get this weird sound? And, you know, but also, um, you know, the, the, we all know that the element of time for what we can do in the studio, for what we do in our daily lives with all of the, the different things, uh, we have going on and the, and the, the different jobs you have to have because now you're your own social media director and you're your own this and your own that. Um, you know, we don't usually have like two days to work on a, on a drum sound. You know, yeah. I mean, it, some, some, some mega sessions might, but generally most of us mortals, you know, have to get a move on. Well, you got uh, one, one hour to record the drums and seven to um, post it on Facebook for the rest of the day and contact your email list, right? <laughs> yes. And then there's, then there's the whole, you know, like editing has become a thing, but editing was always there with tape editing. But, um, I have to say that watching some of the great tape editors, you know, because there quite, there's, I guess, like less obvious places you could do an edit and you can do digital edits in kind of more unlikely places in the music. But, you know, John Lecky was an incredible tape editor. Mitch Easter, uh, who I worked with on a couple of records is a badass tape editor. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a wonderful, uh, Nick Lanay, uh, who we worked with is a great tape editor. Um, that, you know, but it seemed to go more quickly, you know, I mean, but again, also people tailored their performances to a world where, where you had to really think about it if you were going to do tape edits yeah. um, to some degree. And maybe the tape edit itself was more like watching a magician do a really nice trick in the studio <laughs> than, you know, when everybody stops and then everybody's just staring at the back of the head of, of somebody on the computer just clicking and zooming around the screen. It's a different yes. experience, right? There's there's something tactile. There's you know it's tactile with the tape edit, and so that has a certain. Um, it's like watching a very good tailor at work. Exactly. Yeah, it's a physical dance in the control mm -hmm. room. Well, so um, how about I, I have lots of questions, but maybe let me jump to this one because I think we all want to know what the story was of you and and John helping to reform Big Star because that's such a important moment and the history of rock and roll and the history of music. Can you tell us that story? Yeah. Um, basically, you know, our, our first album came out in 1988, released as a cassette initially. Um, and we had, uh, and we got a very large amount of success in Seattle very quickly. So we had a good name. We also, three of the four of us, in other words, everybody but myself, worked in record stores. And when this record came out and it was on the radio and all this stuff, and people were hearing it, um, you know, the, the older guys took us aside and said, well, if you're into this kind of thing, you should check out this band, Big Star. Um, and the records, uh, there were some vinyl reissues that were available. And so we, you know, basically love at first sight, um, when we or love at first listen, shall we say, when these records came out, um, came, well, came into our lives. So, you know, somewhere around 1989, for sure, we were absolutely devoted Big Star fans. We were covering um, "Feel" by Big Star, and soon we were covering "I'm the Cosmos." When somebody slipped us a cassette of the as yet unreleased at that time uh, Chris Bell album, and so on and so forth. Um, and it, we also, um, so you know, and I have bootlegs of us, you know, opening for the Replacements in '91 and all this kind of thing. And we played, you know, "Feel" and "I'm the Cosmos" every night. It was a major part of what we were about. Yeah. Uh, we became like serious zealots. Um, you, got, you guys were paying tribute to the band that you loved. Ev yeah. On a nightly basis. Um, and we, we looked before we, while we were looking into our first major label album, the one that we ended up doing with John Leckie in Seattle, we looked into doing it at Arden as a possibility. We, we eventually decided that we didn't feel, we felt a little bit insecure about taking such a big step with a major label budget. And we felt staying in Seattle might, might at least feel a more comfortable or whatever. Um, so, um, we, we contacted Arden though, and we're absolutely shocked to find that Jody Stevens sent us back the brochure and cover letter. Nice. Now, boys and girls, a brochure is like a website that you print out on paper. Um, <laughs> right. Indeed. It, Yes, there there was no websites back then, so you had to write to a place or call a place, and they send you like a little 
pamphlet with pictures and info. Right. So you're you're basically saying you you contacted the studio to record and you discovered that Jody Stevens, the drummer from Big Star, was actually the, the, working. He was the website developer before there were websites. <laughs> he, he was the you know the studio manager and and the and the face of Arden Studios. So that just you know we just couldn't believe it. Like it's like basically for us it would be like basically going to the library and finding like Cervantes behind the desk, you know, like, Oh, can I, can I help you? You know, like it was just like a mythical person was real. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, got to know him, uh, that year we went to CMJ and he was there and he loved what we were doing and he was very flattered that we covered big star songs. So, I mean, that's how we got on his radar and that, and by being on Jody's radar, that eventually led to when Alex Chilton, who had, up to that point, shown absolutely no interest of revisiting uh, Big Star's music for yeah, more than yeah. a song or two every now and then in his solo sets. Said, "Oh, sure, whatever. I'll play. I'll I'll, I'll do a show as Big Star. Why not?" Um, that's, that's cool. Okay, this, can this, can you in a sentence or two? Can you explain to the rock stars what CMJ was? Because that was a really important. Well, I think it still exists. Oh, okay, uh, great. But it's the it's it's the. <laughs> CMJ is the college music journal. So that was, that's, it's, um, an industry, um, what do they call those things? So uh, it's zine magazine it's, for it's, journal. It's a trade journal. Trade it's journal, a trade yeah, journal. Yeah. It's a trade journal that tracks college radio airplay and it still exists. Um, and they host a conference in New York, um, in the fall. And that's a, you know, like South by Southwest, it's a time for showcasing new artists and also for artists to, you know, announce their new stuff and labels to show off their new releases and all this kind of thing. Um, so that, yeah, so we were on tour for that major label album in, in the fall of 1990. And we, we, we knew Jody was going to be at CMJ and he came to see us play. You know, I mean, the, the more this went on and the, the more into it we were, I mean, I remember like on our first tours, like driving in the van and just like Big Star was always on and this kind of thing. I mean, we're just ridiculously into this band. Um, so but so we're, you know, uh, so we're a lot of people. I mean, uh, you know, the, the replacements, you know, were well known for, you know, you know, they'd written the song Alex Chilton about Alex from from, yeah. from Big Star, and Alex had actually played on that album that The Replacements did in 1987, Pleased to Meet Me, and that was recorded at Arden, where obviously yeah. the, the Replacements are coming to pay homage to, to Big Star, really. Was that John, uh, John Hammond who produced John Hammond them? didn't do that. That was Jim Dickinson. Jim Dickinson, that's right. That yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And then, you know, uh, R.E.M. had mentioned that. I mean, in fact, I'm sure R.E.M. was how I heard about Big Star. Um, because I was a huge R.E.M. fan when I was in high school and I was a Rolling Stone subscriber and I got Musician Magazine and a few other things. And, you know, like in the early days of R.E.M. was like pouring through the pages, hoping to get a, a glimpse of this mysterious band that I discovered. Um, and that's the Mitch Easter connection, too. I'm sure that was all connected for you. Yes. Um, and so, you know, I, I saw this name dropped in, in several reviews over the years. Never really had a way to... <clears throat> find out what that name Big Star meant in terms of records as records were just impossible to find when I was here in Bellingham but it was all starting to come together but anyway um, in 1993 Alex said hey I'm you know interested I'm willing I'm willing I'm willing to play Big Star's music under the name Big Star with Jody um, so there you have it and this was going to be this is a college spring fling concert uh, in Columbia Missouri at the University of Missouri, um, put on by the guys from KCOU, the college station there. And they needed more people than Alex and Jody to play a live show. Um, Chris Bell, the guitar player, had been long since deceased. Andy Hummel, the bass player, uh, was well entrenched in the aerospace industry down in Texas and was kind of like, nah, you know, I'd rather not. Um, so they needed at least a guitarist and a bass player. And of course the kids putting this show on said, we better get somebody big. So they talked to Mike Mills and they talked to Paul Westerberg. Um, they talked to Matthew Sweet, um, blah, 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 blah. And none of them could or would do it. Um, and so, you know, we just kept pestering basically, <laughs> you know, and we had, you yeah. know, our frosting on the beater was basically came out the weekend that we did this show. 
Um, and you know, we had some renown from our previous album, uh, et cetera. Um, so we were a little bit known, but I think it was actually, you know, I have to nominate ourselves as the right choice because all the other guys, the, the well-known musicians that could have done it would have been too busy with their own careers to really do it much. And it would have, you know, maybe overshadowed, you know, if Mike Mills had been playing with Big Star, it would have been all about... People have been like, who's, Mike, who's this Mike other Mills, guy? You know, well, yes. I know Mike Mills, but who's this other guy? Yeah, so, well, I think it's cool. I, and I think it's encouraging mm -hmm. to rock stars, to the listeners, to remind everybody that you guys took something that you were way into mm -hmm. that other people didn't necessarily know about yet. You had only just learned about it. Not only that, but the band themselves, you know, uh, Alex wasn't even necessarily all that interested in in reforming the band. And you guys just persisted and you just did it until it happened. And then until it worked, you just you just didn't give up, which is great. Yeah. And, and we're still, you know, I mean, 23 years after that first show, you know, we're still heavily involved in, in keeping Big Star's music out there. Um, you know, we've been doing these shows, uh, playing Big Star's third album, uh, which require, if you're going to do it note for note, which we've been doing, it requires, you know, strings, woodwinds, percussion, mm. all the stuff. And we've been doing that. And that, that project was spearheaded by Chris Stamey, um, great pro producer, musician, arranger, et cetera, um, who, along with Mitch Easter, had a band in the 70s and had a label that put out the I'm the Cosmos 7-inch single, if you want to see the interconnected <laughs> web of how it all works. But um, we've been doing, we've just uh, done, uh, filmed one of these concerts where we play this Big Star's third album, Note for Note. And of course, Jody Stevens, the last living member of Big Star, is a huge part of it. I'm a part of it. John from the Posies is there. Chris Stamey is the musical director. Mike Mills plays with us. Um, we have special guests on this particular concert that we filmed. Jeff Tweedy, Pat Sensone from Wilco, who are, you know, Wilco yeah. in their covers set that they do in their festival when they do the covers night. They do three Big Star songs out of a 14 song set. Um, that shows you their level of fandom. Um, Pat, Pat was just on the show just last week. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Um, um, so, so there's that. That's coming out as a film uh, in the coming year. Well, that's very cool. Very exciting. And, and thanks for telling us all about all that. We will make sure to include links to stuff like that in the show notes. So Rockstars, if you want to check that out, I'll have it all in there for you. Um, Ken, I got a couple of questions I want to ask you before we take a break, and then we'll finish yeah. out with the jam session mm -hmm. if, if we're doing okay on time. Yeah. Um, but I want to ask you about songwriting, and then I want to yes. ask you about guitars. Songwriting. Okay. Tell us a little bit about what the process for songwriting is for you these days. These days, um, I kind of, there's probably two ways. One is just like free hands on the piano. Um, it's actually pretty rare that, that I pick up a guitar. Um, you know, in my later, I started on piano as my first instrument. And well, it's then, because you got the guitar at, I mean, guitar's over now. Exactly. It's killed it. Um, but yeah, piano free hand is probably one way, but also, you know, like I've kind of moved into that you know, kind of Ableton way of, of c composition where like I might come up with a really interesting short loop. Um, I probably won't, I'm too committed to chord changes to like, just let a loop, you know, be the basis for a song, but mm -hmm. it's a good area to explore in, um, getting like some like really esoteric rhythm going with, you know, like weird drum machine patches and delays and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, when you write on the piano, do you like to sit at a piano and just sort of pop your iPhone on top of where the where the music stand is and just kind of capture what you're playing and singing? How do you do that? Do you ever when I sit down at the piano, I'm I'm really not a pianist. Mm. So I'll sit down and I'll come up with something that sounds beautiful to me and literally within moments I can't remember what I just did for the voicing. <laughs> do you run into that and do you have a solution for that at all? No, it's got to be something that I can keep playing. So I will usually hit upon something that that's kind of you know, um, it has, it has a structure and, and it, it's got some, it's got a nugget of info that I want to keep. And, and I'll, you know, my piano is midied up to Pro Tools where, you know, in my little studio world, everything is smart all within, you know, inches of each other. I don't have a ton of space. So I just, you know, record the MIDI straight away. That's really smart right there. That's the answer to that question. I mean, it's not quite the same as a 
you know, the sound of the uh, acoustic piano in the room, but for idea gathering, when you stumble on something, MIDI gives you that immediate ability to uh, sort of figure out what it was that you did. Yeah, and then you can you can quickly, you know, um, edit it. <laughs> yeah, you can you can quantize it if you want to make it. You know, if you're doing something arpeggiated, you know, you can yeah. start there and have something that's pretty tight right away. Well, that's very cool. I love Ableton Live. I haven't been using it a lot lately, but when I have used it, it's just a whole nother world. It's super cool. Yeah, I enjoy it. Um, okay, so next question. Give us something that would help us out about recording guitars in the studio. Um, I wrote down one song that you had that really sounded fantastic uh, coming al right along, for example, with that heavy kind of swirling guitar sound. Is that something yeah. you can talk about? I can. I didn't record that. Um, that's that's John Auer. And I have to tell you something about the song coming right along that's going to blow your mind. Um, that's all done on a four track. Wow. Um, it's just got, you know, this incredible fidelity and depth and that you don't usually associate, you know, four track recordings with low fidelity and wiggly, you know, wiggly tape and right. lots of hiss. And, you know, he just printed the stuff really well and it's got a lot of depth. Um, and a lot of low end and it's a great guitar sound. I think the secret of that guitar sound, um, it's a Gibson three pickup SG from the early seventies. Um, sounds like it's a, drop, maybe drop tuned or something like that. Well, too. it's tuned. Yeah. It's a C minor tuning. So it's like, uh, uh, C G C E flat B flat C. Um, and, but you know, he recorded that really late at night at a really low volume. Um, which is kind of an interesting thing, um, that, you know, the, the, the physics of it, um, are not the physics of a speaker being pushed, you know, like really hard. Um, it's basically, he's barely making any noise. Um, and I think that, you know, that actually gives it that spectacular low end because it would otherwise be compressed out, you know, that the, 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 the mid range would push through. Um, hmm. so yeah, basically at, at, one in the morning, he's playing this guitar through um, an 80s Fender Super Champ, um, you know, that's got a transistor gain, you know, like lead channel kind of deal. Um, I And I don't remember what his recording setup was, but, um, you know, he, he obviously printed it very well to the cassette. Um, there's hardly any noise. And then, you know, basically we, we tried to replicate that in the studio uh, when we got to New York and we're working on Frosting on the Beater. But it was impossible. So we ended up having the four track FedEx to New York and peeled <laughs> off the, the guitar and his vocal. Okay, and, quick question for you. Okay. At yeah. the time that that happened, when you guys yeah. were in the studio making a decision that in this pro studio, you can't capture that same thing that you got off the demo. Yeah. How revolutionary and how scary was it to make that decision that, hey, we're going to use the four track version? Was that like, no way you can't do that? Or had you heard lots of stories about how that's totally cool to just bring in the old, the, the original demo into the master session? What, was there a story behind that? Um, not really. I mean, I, we didn't, we didn't, I didn't know of any other instances where that had been done probably off the top of my head at that point, but we were like, we, this is just what we have to do. You know, like we, yeah. we have, we'll have this four track in 24 hours. We'll see what we can do. And when we pulled the stuff off onto the, onto a 24 track reel, sounded great. Um, you know, and I just, I replaced John's backing vocal with my backing vocal and that was that, you know, um, well, what's really fascinating to me about that too, is something I feel like I, I experience. So mm -hmm. as the artist, mm -hmm. you have, and, and you can stop me and correct me anywhere along the way here, but as the artist, you have this innate gut sense for what's right for the music and what's right for the song to make a call like that, to say like, we need the four track to be laid onto the multi-track to get this right. Whereas sometimes that's more challenging if you're the engineer or the producer to make that same kind of bold call for somebody else's music. Well, I'm not sure I, I do agree, actually. I, I think that I love, you know, taking those kind of chances when I'm working with people. And if they trust you, you know, they're, they're going to be okay with it. Um, I, I, you know, actually find that, that, the artist and, you know, like I often, not all the time, but certainly the way we were in 1992, when we were making that album, you know, we were young and we were pretty insecure actually. Um, 
So it actually, I'm sure that, you know, it was Don Fleming who really pushed to make that four track thing happen because he'd heard all the demos. Um, and you know, like, I think a lot of times if you are an engineer slash producer or whatever, I mean, people are really looking for you to, to not be hesitant. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess I've, trust myself enough or I'm delusional enough (laughs) that, you know, I just, if I feel like we should do something, I just say, we're doing this, you know, and, 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 you know, people can debate me, but. uh, Or or you're wise enough to choose projects where you feel something strongly. Well, I, I, you know, I'm not picky. I work with everybody who wants to work with me um, pretty much if my schedule allows it and the budget and they can, you know, at least pay my rate. Um, but that can be all kinds of things. Um, so I don't, I'm, I really don't handpick projects at all. I kind of let those parameters that, that kind of rules out certain things, but, um, you know, I guess I'm kind of make it clear that I'm coming in to, to make decisions. Yeah. Um, and that that's, what's going to, you know, that's what gives the record an aesthetic. I always say that I, that I, you know, I make records. I don't just record things. So I'm always looking for the, the, the project to have, you know, its own stamp and its own, you know, I mean, anybody who's been recording for a while can, you know, get a basic good drum sound or whatever can get signal to tape or whatever we want to call it. Um, okay. I mean, if you've been doing it, if you've been engineering records for a while, you probably work out that math, but then there's a whole nother level of how sounds and things fit together to make an effect. And that's a record, right? As I see it. That's very cool. Well, um, Ken, we'll take a break here and we'll come back in for the jam session. Right. Rock stars, before we go, I want to remind you that you can find links to all the stuff we're talking about in the show notes, which are, if you're listening in your podcast app on your iPhone, for example, you can just click on it and up comes the logo, click through and it'll it'll show you the show notes right there. Um, that will take you to the blog post, which you can also find at rsrockstars.com. Use the magnifying glass and just search Ken uh, and that will take you to the post. And I'll include YouTube links and things like that to some of the records. There was one that you had on there uh, for Solar Sister, where they had put all these great shots of the movie Clerks. Was there a connection there, or was that somebody just cleverly putting those things together? Yeah, somebody just liked that. Isn't that? I loved it. <laughs> it yeah, we had we have no Kevin Smith affiliations of, as much as it would be great, but um, yeah, that just kind of happened. Well, that's cool. And then rock stars. Um, If you enjoyed the music, the intro music to the podcast, I'll do a little self-plug and and remind you that you can get that. That's from my record, Skadoosh, which you can find at skadooshmusic.com, S-K-A-D-O-O-S-H. And uh, we'll take a break now. We'll come back in for the jam session. Cool. Hey, everybody. It's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks, and you get downloadable multi tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi-track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum kit, bass, and guitars recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444 and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444 or you can go directly to mixmasterbundle.com, enter your email and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. Rock stars, welcome back. This is Lid Shaw and we're here with Ken Stringfellow on Recording Studio Rockstars. We're going to jump into the jam session. Oh boy. Ken, are you ready to jam? 
I, God willing, the creek don't rise. <laughs> All right, man. When you started out in recording, what was a big obstacle that was holding you back? Let's see. I think fresh tape <laughs> <laughs> was probably it. I mean, when we, you know, I, uh, fresh tape and just uh, a wide knowledge of what's been done because I was a teenager. That's cool. probably the biggest thing. And living in a small town, the ability to get information about what music was out there with no internet, et cetera, was, that was a big challenge. So just having a broad knowledge base was slower. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. You couldn't find it on YouTube or whatever. And I don't know that people deal with the fresh tape struggle, but maybe now it's a finding a fresh hard drive, you know, quick, uh -huh. quickly enough. Um, now how about some of the best advice you remember receiving as you kind of have done this for a while? Wow. Um, I received a lot of bad advice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Give us so, some bad advice. <laughs> um, well, I think this, this advice is just, you know, people are zealots about certain things or other, um, you know, and they, they tell you that there's only one way, you know, to do things, etc. cetera. Um, so you can just get your head spun around on that. Um, I have just found that, you know, it, it will make, you'll have, a, you'll have less friends, <laughs> but, um, I think you really, I think the one advice I would ever give someone is don't listen to advice. Um, cool. if that's, if that, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it, I just, I think advice is overrated because people have their own agendas, et cetera. And you know, if you really listen to yourself and you really trust yourself, even when you're a young whippersnapper, you know, my, my gut instincts were always good. It's just that, you know, I was less secure about listening to them and took other people authority more into account and it and it always backfired interesting that's fascinating well you had talked earlier about you know the the perils of letting go too much like like it's almost like i think it's great to collaborate with people and i think it's excellent to let other people bring their very best to the collaboration mm -hmm. but it's it's always a detriment if you sort of let go of your own responsibility too much and, and forget to take responsibility for your input into a process. Yeah, you'll, you'll end up resenting the people later, like as if it's their fault you didn't assert your your responsibility, shall yeah, we say. Yeah. yeah. All right, Ken, so now how about sharing a great recording tip, hack, or secret sauce, something our rock star listeners could use today on their recording session? Anything maybe in vocals that is... Well, yeah, I mean, the mo the obvious one, the, the most expensive mic is not necessarily the best Okay. Uh, for, for a vocal. I mean, that's, that's pretty clear. Um, it really, sometimes, you know, a mic with a limited range, well, mics have, all mics have different response responses frequency wise and, and, you know, certain, uh, nasally or mid rangey voices, you know, might not sound great on, you know, a really a certain mic. I mean, it's really like each mic, not just each brand or model of mic, each mic is usually unique because they have different amounts of wear and tear different environments they've been kept in with different amounts of moisture over the years, um, which can go very bad. Mm -hmm. Um, this kind of thing. How do you know when to keep trying mics, uh, before you record the vocal or when to stop trying mics? Well, I mean, you're usually limited by how many mics are available, but I think, you know, a mic shootout is pretty obvious. Usually mm -hmm. it's pretty clear that one just kind of, I, I think of it as like a visual thing. Is it common for you to do a mic shootout on a session or is that more of a rare thing? It, it's, it's pretty common if I have a good mic selection, you know, I mean, actually at, at home, you know, like I've kind of pared it down to like one mic that I think works generally well mm -hmm. more than the others that I have. Um, and it you know, doesn't really matter what that mic is, rock stars. That's whichever one works best in your studio you know, try it out and you'll figure it out. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you that, um, I, what is that thing called? It's a, uh, I use a blue bluebird at, okay. at home. Cool. You know, I bought this mic, um, because I, I also travel a lot and, you know, I've got like a little studio in a bag, you know, with, I've got a, a 500 series rack with, you know, a couple of Neve pre's and, uh, a, a Lindell audio compressor. Nice. Um, nice, I, nice stocking stuffer. Yeah. <laughs> and I bring that with me. And this, you know, was a, a decent mic that didn't need a fancy power supply that, that seemed to be pretty ruggedly built. 
Um, and I, you know, so this, it, it worked great on the road and, you know, I actually did a mic shootout with it on a couple records and it, and it actually ended up being the mic of choice on a couple different sessions over, you know, substantially more expensive mics. Uh, and so I just, you know, I've, I've kind of, I don't really have any problems with the Bluebird mic. I mean, things that I have to EQ out and whatnot. I mean, maybe the, the detail of the high end isn't as gorgeous, um, as a U47. Um, but folks, I just don't have a U47. <laughs> <laughs> well, neither do I, so no worries. Yeah. Well, now how about, um, a hardware tool? Um, sometimes I ask for a favorite, but it doesn't have to be a favorite, just something you might recommend. And it could be anything at all that seems to just make sessions better when you've got it. It doesn't even have to be a piece of recording gear. Well, um, I have to say that this is going to be super boring, but for these mobile sessions, I've been taking around because, you know, the posies, let's sidetrack here. We, we play with an Ableton setup and we needed a good interface, um, to bring on the road. Mm -hmm. And I've been using this for, uh, recording on, on the road as well. So we have an RME Fireface, hmm. you know, uh, IO converter, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And I have to tell you that, um, that has been a great piece of gear. I've been using it for about a year on the road. Um, it's taken, it's been all over the world several times and has taken it like a champ. Um, I've noticed, you know, just, I mean, if you can compare it to like an M box or something like that, I mean, it's just not even on the same planet. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's got great software as well that, you know, you have a whole nother like mixing inter interface that you can go into and, and do a lot of things with that. So you can actually get some pretty neat stuff going in terms of recording, without having to bring a lot of outboard gear, which I, you know, if I'm going for these mobile sessions, it needs to fit in a carry-on. Well, it's very cool. I mean, I, you hear a lot of talk about a variety of brands, but um, I don't hear people mention RME as much, but Rockstar's RME is one of the first converters on the scene. They've been around for a long, long time. And I think they really, Hammerfall is, maybe that's the same company. They really know their stuff, I think, when it comes to interfaces. So yeah, that's cool I've been really pleased with it. All right, Groovy. Now, how about recommending a really cool software tool? Again, it doesn't necessarily have to be a favorite. It could just be something cool that you've started using recently that you want to talk about. Like, Any fun new plugins? You know, I, I try and use stuff that will show up in a lot of places, um, you know, that every studio will have. So, I mean... That's smart. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I use very basic stuff. I mean, I, you know, like... The Waves R compressor. I mean, I tend to use that more than anything else. Um, I don't really like stuff. It's it's rare that I want like some kind of like vintage thing from a from a from a plugin. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty rare. I usually just want them to do their job and and stay out of the way. Um, so well, I I will say that um, I really like um, the 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 Fab Filter Timeless Delay. Nice. I use that a lot. That's a really good one. You can get some pretty interesting, you can get a lot of things going with that, that device. Um, not only for, you know, interesting trippy delay things, but also very short programs for like, you know, widening a voice in stereo, uh, in the stereo field, um, or chorusing or stuff like that. It's, it's, it's got a lot of, it's got a lot of aspects to it. Well, that's cool. I've been using the FabFilter Pro Q2 EQ, mm -hmm. and it's it's fantastic. So I'm definitely a big fan of their stuff. I haven't tried out the rest of it yet, but I look forward to it. Um, now, how about a resource or advice for the business side of doing this? You know, you have remarkably <laughs> continued to even have the same band from middle school um, to four decades later. What advice do you have for people about um, staying in this financially and, and, you know, making it work for work? Well, the pretty obvious way thing is like to have a small footprint. I mean, especially for a band, um, you know, in this last year with the posies, we went out touring. Um, we didn't, we had no crew and, you know, we basically, at some points we didn't even have backline, you know, we had su support bands that provided the backline and we actually did Europe on this last tour, European tour we did. Um, in John Auer's passenger car um, nice. that, you know, by the time we got the merch and the luggage, two guitars, a snare drum, a cymbal safe, uh, a synth in there, it, there was only room for the three of us. Um, you know, I mean, 
you know, it's a conclusion I came from away with from doing all this. And this is a, I imagine a pretty hard transition for a more established band to make because they've gotten used to like having a crew, at least to move some of the gear and stuff like that. Um, when we did our U S tour earlier this year, and we were hauling not only a full backline, but uh, a PA, um, you know, plus merch, plus luggage, plus all that, um, setting up because we were doing shows, um, in like we were doing like pop-up shows that weren't in clubs um we found some really cool spaces to do shows in the takeaway for me was that loading all this gear and working super hard um we hit a really great rhythm and actually i think i enjoyed it more than i've enjoyed almost any other tour it was really great to know that when the show went off and the pa worked and everything was happening that you know we did that and yeah it, it it seems like an in, like an impossible task, you know, like doing shows every day for a month and all these big drives as you do in the states, and then also you have a PA to set up and get, you know, like we just nailed it. I mean, it was it it was really a great experience. To it's, I think it's a good thing to learn like what you're capable of, and the only way to do that is to like really test your limits. You yeah, know? yeah. People people are very cautious in general about what kind of things are going to go on and, 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 and like, well, we can't do this. We can't do that. And actually, you know, the human beings are, you know, pretty amazing in what they're capable of. Well, it's almost counterintuitive to the message that we hear so much, which is, you know, you really need to learn how to delegate and hire help for this and that and the other thing and focus on your one thing. But, uh, you know, I've even done that recently with the podcast where I sort of, uh, pulled in closer and I, I had more help for producing it. I, I pulled it in and started producing it myself solely recently mm -hmm. and really kind of dialed in the process and really figured out how to pare it down to the absolute essentials, which sounds like that's what you guys did too, you know, and maybe then at that point when you know the utter essentials of what's needed, maybe that's the time to try and get help for it again, if you want, you know, or don't. <laughs> yeah. Or, or not. Yeah. I mean, I think, we, you know, like I've noticed also for what we do, you know, the more, the more control we have, you know, like we, we set up these shows, we do our own ticketing. Um, we do, you know, like I said, we're our own roadies, et cetera. We do our own social media, all of that stuff. We basically exist as a completely self-contained unit. And that has had a, a big uh, influence on the outcome, not only financially, but also like how the shows feel and how, good the experiences are for the audiences and for us each night. Um, and I can tell you that, that, that it's a much, the more control we have, the better it is for everybody. You know, they, they, they yeah. get, they get your aesthetic too. They get you, you've created the vibe and you know, if you don't want a, a Miller beer sign, there isn't one, you know I mean? This yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Well, so rock stars, I think the encouraging takeaway from that too, is that like, don't be afraid to dial it back and don't ever feel like dialing it back and maybe, um, having less help to do what you do is somehow a step backwards. It might in fact be a step forward is, is yeah. the way you're describing it, which is cool. You, and you learn new skills. Yeah. Well, so a couple more questions and we're out. Ken, how about um, sharing uh, an organizational online resource? Some, you know, you have to keep track of a lot of stuff doing your productions, traveling all over touring. What advice do you have for people about sort of staying organized in this online world these days? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, of course, um, I use TweetDeck, which people, I'm, I'm surprised that more people that I know don't use. They're always like, what is that? And TweetDeck is um, a place where you can have, you can manage several Twitter accounts, like your personal and your band, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or your studio or your label or whatever. You can manage them all from one spot. And you can also have multiple searches, you know, going. So you can always see when somebody tweets about you or your project or whatever and have that coming in one in, in, in a columnated feed. So they're all Very organized. Cool. And yeah, that's, that's a great tool. Um, do you, do you therefore find that Twitter is a really good platform for what you do? Well, it, it certainly doesn't hurt, you know, like, like Twitter is pretty good instant gratification. I think, um, you know, I have more followers on Facebook, mm -hmm. um, but Twitter, yeah, but I think you got, well, I mean, they're all like in tandem. It's like, would you, um, I don't know what, to, what analogy would be, but it's kind of like formats for, you know, like, would you rather, would you rather be on digital or vinyl? It's kind of like, no, I'd rather have everything. So everybody right. can get me. <laughs> right. Right. Um, for the touring, I can't say enough about, um, Eventbrite. 
um, you know, for, for setting up the shows, like if you're doing living room shows or whatever, it, it, that is just the tool. I mean, it's a great, great tool. Okay, great. I, I may need to know that yeah. about using that myself for a, a rock star events. Mm-hmm. Um, well, very cool. And then I think I remembered you responding to one of my emails saying it's all in Google Docs, you know, which I use that like crazy too. And I find that to be extremely helpful. Keeping yeah, things organized. That's the, the, uh, the press photos are in Google Docs. Yeah. yeah, that's smart. All right. So here, this last question is hypothetical. Mm-hmm. And we're going to take the Wayback Studio machine. Oh. And uh, Ken, experienced Ken, is going to go back and find young Ken. I uh-huh. guess, I guess, in middle school or in high school, you know, at this point. And you're gonna, you're gonna come up uh, from behind, tap yourself on the shoulder, turn around, and you know, hey, older Ken, what are you doing here? And you're gonna say, well, I've come to give you this one bit of advice. That here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio one day. What would you tell yourself? Trust yourself. Like if you if you feel it say it. That's pretty, that's totally it. That's great. Mm. I love it, man. Well, Ken, thank you so much for joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars, man. It's been a really a pleasure hanging out with you and talking and just hearing great stories of your band, um, playing with Big Star and REM and all kinds of cool stuff. Plus great tips. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks. I'm glad we got this organized basically in less than 24 hours. Yeah, we're pretty badass. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, how can listeners find you, follow you, and uh, and reach out to you? Twitter and Instagram at Ken Stringfellow. That, that's probably the best way. Um, you know, my Facebook profiles are kind of full. I don't. I tend to do my personal profiles a little more than my pages. So if you find me on Facebook, you can at least follow me on Facebook, and you'll get updates. But you know, at Ken Stringfellow, Twitter, Instagram is probably where I'd send people. Okay, Groovy. Well, thank you so much. Rock stars. We'll have uh, links to all this again, as I pointed out in the show notes. And Ken, I hope to see you around the studio someday. Indeed. Likewise. All right, man. Cheers and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rock Stars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.